again in relation to the state capture inquiry. Professor Fikeni, can you hear us now? I can hear you. You're on the line now and when our conversation got cut off, we were just talking about the processes in terms of where the state capture process started leading up to the very last testimonies and you were giving us your thoughts on that. Yes, I was saying that it confirms much of what we've read in the media. But at the same time, it was now formalized. It was presented with a context. Now we know how the state institutions were overridden and how state-owned companies were undermined in many ways. But it will become more interesting when you start having cross-examination as well as forensic testing to validate some of the claims or denials. Former President Jacob Zuma stated that he wasn't interested in cross-examining anyone because he wasn't personally implicated in all the testimony that came through. Did you have a sense that no valid testimony came through in terms of specifics and uh, actuals? I do think that there is all over the place something that points directly to him. Initially, he might have had some validity in that claim when fingers were pointing at some of his ministers at the Gupta family. But now, increasingly, things have come directly to him, so he has a case to answer. Let's break down the different testimonies. Uh, Feki Mento, uh, former Deputy Minister Jonas, Mr. Godan. Uh, Cheryl Carolas, which testimony for you carried a lot of weight? Well, I do think that they all had something to contribute, but Ramatodi was quite an interesting one because he was quite direct and forthright. And he also analyzed the state of politics because others tended to stay away from politics. But also Cheryl Carolas was yet another weighty one. Probably uh, Mr. Maine came in already having a very negative position and also trying to question the very legitimacy of the state inquiry. To that extent, I don't think he therefore spent more time on very specific factual issues. He came to argue a political case in a judicial process. There were a lot of questions about the credibility of uh, Mr. Maine's assertions. Your take? To some degree, because he has been quite embroiled, involved in the business interests of the family and also has taken a political position, it will be very difficult for him to present a purely tactical, factual uh, position without having to veer into the political space or the perception that there is conspiracy. So that tends to cloud judgment. Similarly, the likes of Feki Mento, since she has been quite vocal in the media, social media, in the book publication, having taken a political stance, the same thing when you try to solve a judicial or governance issue through political responses, it tends to be cluttered. Major banks also came to testify about why they felt pressured to close the accounts of Gupta-linked companies. What, what, what did you make of the, their testimonies? Well, I do think that uh, they made their point uh, that they were pressured, but at the same time, they ought to have understood the context that under those circumstances, there is already a suspicion that you do have four dominant banks which can shape or close down, facilitate, frustrate any economic activity. So anyone interested as to whether their position was not influenced by politics uh, was actually, uh, you know, a legitimate concern. It's a question of whether when they satisfied themselves and explained to the political figures, they felt that pressure was still going on. We do know for a fact that Mosebenz is one of the programs with the cabinet, which seem to have been satisfied with the explanation and continued pursuing. And uh, as we now know, the fact that Mosebenz is one had greater affinity and connection to the Guptas and the former president than the rest.
You were saying earlier that uh, uh, Ramakhlodi's testimony was one of the strong testimonies in the process and as a result, Lenko CEO Ivan Glassenberg has said that he's willing to testify in terms of how ownership of Optimum Coal was moved from them to the Guptas, ending up with ESCOM paying about 600 million rands to facilitate that transaction. What do you think we can uh, learn from uh, Glassenberg? I don't think we can learn much more than the facts we already have. It's quite clear that the process to tilt the balance towards the Guptas was already in space and everything was going to be done. But at the same time, we should be cautious not to swing the pendulum to the other extreme. Some of these mining giants are not squeaky clean. because Some of them had prices which were quite steep and uh, they cry foul. But at the same time, I can't quite fathom why some people argue that the giving away of these mines into an immigrant community is black empowerment, because some people have been saying black empowerment. There are many prospective business people within the country. It doesn't have to take some people who came in, had close political proximity to the leadership, to do just that. And these are the seeds of the degeneration of ESCOM that today we're experiencing. So the inquiry depends on whistleblowers to provide information that it needs to investigate. In fact, uh, the Deputy Chief Justice Zondo has repeatedly made uh, uh, requests to, to the South African community to say, if you have anything that you think can stick, approach us. What are your thoughts on this almost non... Uh, <sighs> People are, are not really wanting to come forward to talk. What do you make of that? Uh, it's a number of factors. One, people see this space as politically polluted. You do, you damned, you don't, you damned. And they do not see the kind of insulation or protection. And some of them might think this is a public space, and even if you go into any private confession, it will land up in the newspapers and in public and in the social media. So those are some of the deterrents that we have. The other one, let us admit that many people have lost faith in this thing called commissions of inquiry because so much is done. There is so much fire and fury, but in terms of implementation, we have not been doing very well as a country. So people may think it doesn't really matter. Professor Fikeni, just in closing, let me go back to uh, Mzwanele Mani's testimony and how he reminded us that this process was not a court of law, that important separation of the inquiry from uh, uh, judicial processes. Uh, how important is this in terms of making sure that those who are implicated uh, are prosecuted? It is very important where you do have very direct evidence that the process leads into the NPA and thereafter you do have charges taking place. That is why it is very important to have NPA having reshaped itself, reconfigured itself and redeemed itself such that by the time there are strong leads that these individuals and other individuals are involved, they can take from there and you have criminal prosecution processes. Your confidence in the NPA of uh, Advocate Shamila Batohi? The eyes are on the NPA. The public eyes are on the NPA. She will have to do more to make sure that it is redeemed, but also it will take other arms of government and political players not to undermine the NPA because the main problem there has been efforts to un override whatever processes or institutional arrangements were there. Well, she did say coming in that those who were frustrating the ends of justice would not be tolerated. So our eyes, as uh, Professor Fikeni says, are all looking to her. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Somatotas Fikeni.